As you're returning to your places, I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word and uh, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, we're going to go look at uh, Moses's, God's call of Moses, and how Moses was ultimately willing to, uh, I guess, eventually surrender to God's call in his life. And so today I want to talk to you about answering God's call in your life. Last week I began preaching a brand new sermon series entitled Navigating Life's Journey. And as God's children, we need to understand that we are on a journey. Uh, we're on a journey to follow God wherever He wants us to go and to be whatever He wants us to be. Last week, we looked at, a, at uh, Genesis chapter 12 and Abram and God's call on Abram, Abram's life and His ultimate call, call that would lead to God's blessing in His life. And as we talked about last week, everybody wants to see God's blessings in our life. I want to see God bless me. You want to see God bless you. But then also we talked about last week that God blesses us for the purpose of not storing up those things for ourselves, but then blessing others along the way. Today I want to talk to you about answering God's call. When God calls you to do something, now, a lot of times we think of the call of God as being on the pastor's life, or a call to be a missionary, a call to be a preacher. I want you to know that is not the only call that is, we looked at in Scripture. Every person, here's my belief, every person in this room is called to do something for God and His kingdom. Every person in this room Every person in this room, G.K. Chesterton, a number of years ago, he made this statement that confused a lot of people unless you understood the context. He said, anything worth doing, how many of you know the last part of the phrase? Is worth doing, now you may have heard it wrong, is worth doing badly. Now a lot of people just can't believe that that's what he said. A lot of people change it to say anything worth doing is worth doing your best, right? Isn't that the way we normally hear it? Go read the original quote. He said anywhere, anything worth doing, G.K. Chesterton said, is worth doing badly. What was his point? His point was this. Too many of us want the professional to do it. We think we have to go to, if we're going to do something for God, we have to spend 12 years in seminary. We have to get a Master of Divinity. We have to get a PhD. We have to do this and we have to do that. He was making a play for and in context for an understanding that we all need to simply answer God's call and do it. Now, his context that he was talking about, he was specifically talking about the education system at the time. And his point was, he was encouraging moms that the best teacher is always mom. That you don't always have to give your child over to someone else to be trained or someone else to be taught. And that's what he said. He said, sure, there are certain times and certain seasons in our lives when we need a specialist. But he said, most of the time, we just need someone who is obedient. A couple of years ago, uh, after I surrendered the ministry, been more than a couple of years, a couple of decades ago now, um, just as I was surrendering the ministry and for the first time in my life, uh, really getting right with God, I went through a Bible study called Experiencing God. Henry Blackaby, how many of you ever went through Experiencing God? Raise your hand. Okay, so about half of you haven't experienced God. <laughs> no. And, and here was the point, is Henry Blackaby basically came up with, if you're going to experience God, experience God, here are seven things, seven key ingredients to look at. Uh, number one is that all, God is always at work around you. Some of you went through the Bible study, you might remember these seven. We need to understand God is always at work around us. God is at work in your neighbor's life, at the office, at school, wherever you are, among your friends. God is always at work around you. We just have to open our eyes in order to see it. Second thing he said is God pursues a love relationship with you. God's working around us, but God wants a love relationship with us. God desires for us to grow in knowledge of Him and love Him more and follow Him in obedience more. The third thing he says is God invites you to become involved in His work. This is every person, and he was kind of fighting against the idea that, man, if something great is to be done, it's going to be the pastor. He says, no, God invites you to get involved 
in His work. You don't have to go get two master's degrees. You don't have to go get a PhD. God is inviting you, emphatically, you to get involved in His work. Fourth thing he said is God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, circumstances, and the church. That there are times that the Holy Spirit says, you know what, you need to go talk to them. You need to go share your faith with them. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to make this adjustment in your life. Or circumstances. Sometimes circumstances orchestrated in such a way that they seem to lead us to a certain conclusion. Or, listen to this, sometimes, believe it or not, God speaks to you through others. As a matter of fact, listen to this, from time to time, when you come in here on Sunday morning, God speaks to you through me. How many of you, at least once or twice, that's happened? Now, I know there are a lot of times that uh, most people come in here and say, you know what, I can think of a person or two that that message really applies to. And I sure wish they were here. Be honest, how many of you have ever thought that about one of my sermons? I could tell you a person or two that I wish would have heard that. I want you to know, God is speaking to you today. Every person in this room, God is speaking to you. Now, when God invites you to join in in His work, I want you to hear this, the next thing. It always causes a crisis of faith or belief. If God calls you to do this or God calls you to do that, you're going to have a crisis in your life. Can I do it? Am I smart enough to do it? Boy, what if they reject me? What if I go to share my faith? What if I go to invite my neighbors to church? What if I do this? What what if, what if, what if? That's a crisis of faith. You have to step back. If God, God asked me to do it, then I just need to do it. Here was the last thought that Henry Blackaby says, is we really get to know God. We only really get to know God when we follow Him in obedience. When we follow Him in obedience. See, there are a lot of people that have studied their Bible, and they know a lot about God, but they don't know God a lot. I'm going to say that again. There are a lot of people that know a lot about God, but they don't know God a lot. The only way you really get to know God a lot is by following Him in faith and obedience, by trusting God and saying, you know, your word says this, I feel like you've spoken to me here, therefore I'm going to be faithful here, God. And we're going to see the instance in Exodus chapter 3 and 4 where God calls Moses. And so hopefully today as I, as I walk you through that call of God on Moses' life, I hope every man, every woman, every single, every married, everyone that's young, everyone that's old, When we look at this, you would realize this is also God's call on your life. Now, your call is not going to be to go remove the children of Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. But your call may be uh, to serve somewhere, to give something, to do something, to be a part of missions. God's got a call on your life. All right, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 and following. Let's look at it. It says, The Lord said, this is God speaking to Moses in the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, it says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Here's some good news right here from verse 7. God, if you are struggling, if someone around you is struggling, God has seen the misery. Of his people. Anytime God's people are miserable or suffering or struggling, God sees it, and that's an incredible comfort. Look next. Not only that, I have heard them crying out. Have you ever been in one of those seasons in your life where you are crying out, it's pain, you're struggling, and you say, Man, I don't know that God hears me. I don't feel like God hears me. I don't think God hears me. I want you to know this affirms right here that the children of Israel had been crying out. It didn't seem like God heard them. But God is telling Moses right now, I've heard the cries of my people. Next, and I am concerned for their suffering. Now, God sees, God hears, and God is concerned. I want you to know that if you, are, if you are there and you have a neighbor who is lost or a neighbor whose marriage is struggling or this or that, and I want you to know if you're concerned, God's concerned. If you see it, God sees it. 
But notice as we go on, look at verse 8. Now God's speaking to Moses from the burning bush, so I've come down to rescue them. God says, I'm going to come down, I'm going to rescue them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey, which happens to be the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and all the otherites. All right? They're just loaded up right there. God says, I've seen, I've heard, I'm concerned, now I'm going to rescue them and I'm going to bring them out. Now look at verse 9. It says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now, I want you to know in verse 7, 8, and 9, my guess is Moses is looking at God and listening to God in the burning bush, and he's saying, that's great, God. Man, the, the Israelites are suffering. They're struggling. They're hurting. You need to go rescue them. Moses was all in on verse 7, 8, and 9. It's verse 10 that Moses struggles with. Well, what's in verse 10? Verse 10 says, so now go. God looks at him and says, I've heard, I've seen, I'm going to rescue them. And then God looks at Moses and says, so now go. In other words, go do your part. You want, uh, I want you to be involved in the process. So God says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is what Moses struggled with. Moses was all in on God rescuing the children of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. God was all in on God hearing their cry. God was all in, uh, Moses was all in on all of that. Until God says, then I'm going to use you. You know, a lot of times uh, we're that way in the church, aren't we? We're all in on starting a new missions. We're all in on missions in general. We're all in on, uh, on building a chapel or, or doing something for the youth or do, doing something for the community. We're all in. We need to do that. We need to do that. We need to do that. Until God says, you're right, and I'm going to use you. And what usually happens after that? We immediately step back and say, well, uh, I'm not qualified for the job. I think, I think sadly, we, we need to go back to Chesterton's thought today. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. His point was in the church and so many other places, we always have a heart to do something or we gain God's heart to do something and we think, you know what, the pastor needs to do that too. And the pastor needs to do that too. And when he's done with that, he needs to do that. And he needs to do that. And he needs to do that. Verse 10 says, if God's put it on your heart, you probably need to be the one doing it. And you don't have to get a master of divinity. You don't have to get a PhD. You don't have to get trained. All you have to do is faithfully follow God. Now, let me talk to you about effort and good works and energy. And and you've heard me say this over and over again. Let me give you a key thought. You ready? Key thought. Put it up on the screen. When it comes to us serving God, while effort and good works are not involved in our salvation, they are absolutely involved in growing our faith and obedience to God's call. I want you to know... Before salvation, your good works, your effort, anything you do for God in the church could never be good enough to get you saved, to to provide for you forgiveness of sins. However, after we are saved, we are all in on good works and effort. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Let's put it up. Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one should boast. Verse 8 and verse 9 absolutely tell us that if you have a dividing line here, and here's salvation, prior to salvation, your good works mean nothing. They can never earn you salvation. However, once we move beyond that salvation point, good works are absolutely involved in God's plan for your life. Not just the pastor's life, not just the deacon's life, not just your life group teacher's life. Every one of our lives, look at it in verse 10. God says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, everybody in here, God has equipped you and is calling you to do something for His kingdom. 
It may be great, it may be small, it may be seen, it might be unseen, it might be significant or it might be insignificant. Regardless of what it is, God is calling you and me to do something great in His kingdom. But we have to answer the call. So let me give you today, hopefully, four keys for answering God's call in your life. You ready? Number one, thought number one is this. God commands our attention. God commands our attention. Folks, God wants our focus. God wants our attention. God doesn't want to be an afterthought. God doesn't want to be, hey, listen, God doesn't look at us and say, hey, you're, you're doing fine without me. Just, just carry on. If something bad goes on, call me. God, God doesn't do that. God is involved in every area of our life. Remember what he said a few minutes ago. God is always at work around us. Then he invites us to get involved in his work. That's exactly what we see here. Look, Exodus chapter 3, verse 3. God demands our attention. Moses is out there tending. He's working. He's tending his father-in-law's flocks. and he, he, he's, he's shepherding is what he's doing. And then Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, it says, so, when Moses, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. What was a strange sight? Man, Moses is out there shepherding the flocks. He looks over, and he sees a fire. Now, it probably wasn't that uncommon for him to see a fire. We can think of today uh, uh, in dry, humid areas. Right now, California, wildfires northwest. A couple of years ago, remember when we didn't have any rain here? Well, there were wildfires blowing all through Texas because of lightning or whatever. It was not that uncommon for them to see fires out in the desert and even bushes ablaze. However, this bush ablaze was a little different because the bush was on fire, but the fire wasn't spreading, nor was the bush being consumed. So Moses, he says, that's something unique. It says, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. Look at verse 4. So God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And notice Moses' response, here I am. I want you to know this. When, when God places a call on your life, the question for you is, are you going to stop? Turn, look, and when God calls your name, are you going to say, here I am? Here I am. I think a lot of times, and because we've been plagued with this idea, I think, in the Christian walk and in the Christian journey, that, well, we have to leave all of God's work to the professionals. That God calls you to do something, and God calls you to do something, and God calls you to do something. The first thing we think is that is a great thing to do. I'm going to call and tell the pastor to do it. Or see if we can get the deacons on this. And the truth is, God is calling you to do something great in His church and in His kingdom. The question for us is, are we willing to say, Lord, here I am? Well, we see this, uh, how does God get our attention? You know, in, in Exodus chapter 3, God got Moses' attention with a burning bush that didn't burn. I think there are times that God gets our attention. I think God can sometimes get our attention through circumstances. You might want to write that down. Man, there are times that circumstances in our life just happen to change. They happen to be a certain way or, or things begin to happen. And, and, and God gets our attention. Man, just shakes us up. And I think sometimes God does that because we have a tendency to do exactly what I said a few minutes ago. We, we think God has just said, hey, you're, you're doing fine without me. Call me if something goes wrong. And if that's the way you're living your life or that's the way I'm living my life, sometimes God will say, well, let me make something change a little bit. Let me change the work structure. Let me change your environment. Let me change this. Let me change that. Because that's a way that God can get our attention. So sometimes God is trying to get your attention by changing your circumstances. There's another way I believe, and you can write this down. I think sometimes God has to get our attention through struggles. When we go through struggles in our life, 
C.S. Lewis, who years ago said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts at us in our pain. I think there are times that God allows us to go through struggles in our life because he wants us to come back and be dependent on him. He wants us to stop and listen to his voice from the burning bush. But, but we're so busy celebrating our own victories and our own things and all the good things, high-fiving ourselves and high five, patting ourselves on the back, that God has to allow some struggles to come in our lives so we're willing to pause and truly listen to him. I think there are times you might want to write this down that God speaks to us through others. You speak to us through others. If the pastor gets up and shares a message like today on God's call in your life, and you need to understand that God's placed a call on your life. And if you examine your life and, and there are really no effort, no energy in your spiritual journey, your spiritual walk, you don't serve, you don't witness, you don't go on mission, you don't give, you don't do anything, I want you to know. Part of this message is for God to have a call on your life. Hopefully you'll hear it. That Moses wasn't out looking for a burning bush. But when he saw one, he knew it was God speaking. Sometimes, you write this down, God speaks to us through our own natural abilities, our own giftedness. Man, sometimes you just you say, man, I, I don't know why God did this. I don't know why God blessed me this way. I don't know why God did this. And Man, all of a sudden you, you, you see something that ama- amazing that happens in your life. All of a sudden you get a promotion you didn't expect. And in your own heart, in your own mind, you know that you didn't deserve. You think, God, that's a gift from you. Let me do something. Sometimes it's a different way. Some people have a natural ability, a natural giftedness to do certain things. And you're like, God, you gave me this talent. You gave me this gift. You, you know, God, you gave me this gift. I can hit a 97-mile-an-hour 97 fastball. How can I use it for you? That's a natural talent. That's a skill. That's a gift. We've got to look at all of those natural abilities, and everybody, you have them. God oftentimes will speak to us through them, but I want you to know it starts with God will get your attention. So here's my encouragement to you. When you see the bush, stop and look. Because if you want, God God may allow some troubles and some struggles and some hardships to come in your life to kind of shake your tree. Here's a second thought as I looked at this passage. God deserves our respect. God deserves our respect. Man, we we see this right here with Moses as Moses begins to approach uh, the, uh, the burning bush. Notice what it says. God looked at him and God said, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Man, God says, Listen, just hold on a minute. I love the idea, and we should cherish the idea, and rightly so, that in the book of Hebrews, we are told uh, by God that through Jesus Christ and His grace and His love and His sacrifice, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Man, we can walk in boldly. But I want you to know, coming in boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace is totally different than coming to God in our prayers and bossing Him around. And I think there are a lot of times that we come in our prayers to God and we boss Him around. We tell Him, God, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, and after you've done that, we'll talk. Man, God says, that is not the way I operate. God stopped Moses and said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then He said, I am the God of your Father. The God of Abram. Remember we talked about him last week. You know the whole reason there is a nation of Israel? That you're so concerned about Moses? You want to know why there is a nation of Israel who's even in captivity in uh, in the hands of the Egyptians? You want to even know why? God says, because I called a man named Abram long before you were even born. And I promised him if he would follow me, I would bless him. So this nation, Moses, that you're concerned about, (laughs) they're my creation. He says, I'm God of your father Abram and Isaac and the God of Jacob. 
At this, Moses then understood, I am speaking to the God of the universe. It says that Moses hid his face because he was afraid to even look at God. Man, God deserves our respect. God deserves our worship. What did Jesus say in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 22? Remember that passage? The teacher of the law came to Jesus, and you know they had, they had developed these 613 laws so they wouldn't somehow sin against God. And they came to Jesus kind of testing him and says, Teacher, what is the greatest law of all the laws? Jesus looked at him. Remember in Matthew chapter 22? We won't read it, but I'll just tell you what it says. Jesus said, the first and foremost law is this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's respect. Love Him above your own pride, your own ego, your own everything. You love God. Then God says, and after, then He says, then Jesus said, and the second one is like it. You would love your neighbor as yourself. Man, God, God will get your attention, folks. And if you're not paying attention to him, he, he will bring some struggles, some trials, some difficulties in your life to get your attention. The second thing is once God has your attention, he deserves your respect and your worship. That we bow before him. We don't boss God around. We ask God what he would like to say to us. Here's the third idea is God expects our obedience. When God begins to speak to us, God expects us to follow in obedience. Remember verse 10 of Exodus chapter 3? God says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, out of the, out of Israel, my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, I want you to know, anytime God calls you to do something or speaks uh, to you to do something, I want you to know there are some natural hesitancies we all have. And, and, and many times they're right. They're right because we're struggling. They're natural for us to doubt our own abilities and doubt some different things. So let me give you five excuses that Moses gave that you and I oftentimes give as well. All right, you ready? Excuse number one, I, I think you could put this under the category, and we're going to see them all right there, is Moses kind of had a poor self-esteem. Write that, write that down. Moses kind of had a poor self-esteem. You say, where do you see that? Look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Man, when God calls us to do something, that is a very natural response for us to say, Who am I? Man, who am I? But when God showed up to Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus and turned him into Paul, man, almost the first thing Paul began to say was, Why me? Man, I was a persecutor of the church. I was a rejecter of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. Why would God use me? In other words, over and over again, what did Paul say? I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the apostles. I am the least of the apostles. What was he saying? I'm not worthy. Man, if you sense God is calling you to do something, sometimes just like Moses, our first response is, who am I? You want me to tell you who you are? You're a child of God. You're a child of God. And if God has called you to do something, He's going to equip you to do it. Here's another natural hesitancy I think that we all have. A, a natural excuse uh, is a lack of knowledge. Man, Moses just kind of says, I'm not really sure about this, Lord. I, I don't know. He, look at what he says in Exodus chapter 3. He says, Moses said to God, hey, suppose I do go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers, God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what am I supposed to tell them? I love God's response. Tell them, I am the great I am sent you. But I think there are many times that we, we would do something for God, but we're afraid that we won't know the answer to a question. Anybody, anybody in here, and my guess is everyone in here, you ever wanted to go share with your neighbor or share with somebody uh, at the office? You've ever walked in uh, to the break room or something and it happens to be a religious conversation going on about the different religions or something like that? And you want to get in. You want to jump in. You want to give your opinion, but you don't give your opinion because you're afraid what? That someone might someday ask you a question that you don't know the answer to. How many of you, honest, be honest, when you're sharing your faith or if you're thinking about sharing your faith, 
faith. Someone asking you a question that you don't know the answer to scares you. Be honest. We all, we all write. Let me, you might want to write this down. Let me tell you how the pastor handles every one of those situations. Are you ready? And there are times that people ask me difficult, difficult questions. You ready? If that ever happens, I want to encourage you to go ahead and engage from here on out. If someone ever asks you a question that you don't know the answer to, you just tell them this. You ready? This is what I always do. Look them in the eye and go, I don't know. That's it. There are times that people ask me questions all of the time. They will say, Pastor, what will happen if I do this? I've got no idea. Well, I think God has called me to do it. Do you think it's going to turn out okay? Well, if God's called you to do it, it's going to turn out okay. But if God hasn't called you to do it, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, we need, to, we need to understand it's okay to journey into a situation where God has called you that you don't know all the answers. Here's a third thing. I think we're afraid of failure. Man, I want, I want to go work with the youth. I want to serve in the youth. I want to go work in the children. I want to be a life group teacher. I want to go on a mission trip. I, I want to give this. I want to do that. But man, I'm just afraid I'm going to fail. That, Moses was afraid of the exact same thing. Look at it back in the Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and says, What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? What was Moses worried about? Moses was worried about getting all fired up at the burning bush. And I mean that literally, fired up at the burning bush. And all of a sudden, he says, man, God is going to use me to go rescue you. And then Moses goes, uh-oh, what if I show up to them and I say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk out of here. And not only are we going to walk out of Egypt, they're going to give us all their gold. And we're going to walk out of here not far from here, and we're going to be caught against the Red Sea in an impossible situation. And then I'm going to stand up, and we've all seen the movie, right? And, and the water, the jello parts. And we're going to journey through on dry ground, and the Egyptian soldiers are going to get killed behind us. That's all great. But before the fact, what is Moses worried about? That he's going to go, and they're going to look at him and go, You're pretty much an idiot. That's not going to happen. God did not appear to you. He's afraid of failure. Man, we're all afraid of failure. We're all afraid of failing. But if God has called you to do something, you go do it. And if God has called you to do it, you leave the outcome to Him. I think there's another thing. I think a lot of times we're fearful of the public eye. Write that down. And, and we see that with Moses. Man, Moses has been on the backside of the desert. As a matter of fact, if you look in Scripture, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house. He, he grew up uh, amongst the ruling party, if you want to put it that way, there in, there in Egypt. Moses tried at one time to deliver the children of uh, Israel out of the hand of Egypt, and he failed miserably. After he left, he was 40 years old when that happened. For the last 40 years, now Moses is 80 years old and he's living in the desert. For the last 40 years, Moses' entire conversation has been with a bunch of sheep. He's been on the backside of the desert tending someone else's flock. It's not like he'd even been a business leader. He was working for someone else. And now Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been that eloquent of speech, neither in the past nor since. You have spoken to your servant, and I am slow of speech and of tongue. Let me tell you, in the original language, it means I have a heavy tongue. It might have meant that he was a stutter. He didn't speak that well. He struggled a little bit. To, uh, you know, He says, listen, I, I'm not the guy. He says, how am I supposed to go and speak to Pharaoh. How am I going to go wow Pharaoh enough that Pharaoh will look at me and say, yes, you can have the children of Israel. But there's a fifth excuse, and, and I want you to know, I think this is the one that is dangerous. But probably for most people in this room, this is the one that angers God. You say, Pastor, why do you think this excuse angers God? 
because it angered God when Moses gave it. I think it's interesting as you look through this, um, this passage when Moses questioned his own ability, questioned his own knowledge, questioned whether he could speak well enough, questioned what, he, whether he, what would happen if he failed. In all of those, God simply responded to Moses with a word of encouragement and his word. However, when we come to this fifth excuse, and it's a lack of desire, write that down. When Moses finally told God, I don't want to do it. It's interesting. It says, then God's anger burned against Moses. Look at it. It says, Moses pardoned, lack of desire. But Moses said to him, uh, pardon your servant, Lord. How about this? Just send someone else. Just send someone else. It says, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. Here's the point. When Moses questioned his own uh, standing, his own self-esteem, when, when Moses questioned his own ability, when, when Moses acknowledged that he was fearful of failing, when, when Moses questioned that he had learned enough or knew enough, when, when Moses questioned all of those things, God just simply replied to him, man, Moses, so you don't speak so well. Remember God's response, Moses, who made you? Who created the tongue to begin with? Was it not me, God? And you in your life, when you have those doubts, God's going to continue to respond to you the same way. He's going to give you a word. He's going to give you the truth. He's going to invite you to follow Him. But it's this last excuse that fires God up. And I'll tell you today, I think that this fires God up about a lot of Christians today. is that we are just unwilling to follow God. We're unwilling to follow God. We're, we're unwilling to, to, to follow God when it comes to stewardship or giving. We're unwilling to follow God when, when it comes to serving. We're unwilling to follow God when, when we talk about, hey, we need to do this, or God wants us to do that, or, boy, we're, we're looking to help these people, or we're looking to start this new ministry. And a lot of times we sit there and go, yeah, yeah, Lord, do that. Just send someone else. My invitation to you is, don't be a send someone else person. Be a here I am, Lord, send me type person. And that's when you'll see God's blessings. That's when you'll see God's grace. Here's a fourth thought when it comes to answering God's call in your life. We must make adjustments in our lives to follow Him. We must make adjustments in our lives to follow Him. Look at it, Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. But Moses said, pardon your servant. Here we are. In Ex- yeah, go back. Go ahead to the next one. Sorry, go ahead. There we go. To follow Him, Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. And God says, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God gave Moses a promise. He says, listen, if you'll make this adjustment in, my, in your life and follow me, you're going to go get the people, and here's the promise. We're going to come right back to this mountain, and we're going to worship God together. And I love that idea, and I love that thought when God calls His children today to do something, and we leave here. This, folks, this is the huddle, and I've said this before. You understand football season, saw the Cowboys. We're 1-0 one and, one and oh in preseason. But we're still 1-0. They always gather together before they go to the line of scrimmage and run the play. Man, when we come together in church, folks, that's calling the play. Here in a few, minutes, a few minutes, we're going to break. We're going to pray. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And then we're going to go run the play. And we're going to come back. That's what God was saying. We're calling the play right now. The call of God on your life and on my life is to answer the call. To say Yes. And make that adjustment and understand part of God's call is that we would come back next week and we would worship Him on this mountain 
Then God calls us to go out again and serve Him. Then we come back to this mountain and worship Him. And God calls us again and we go out and we come back and we worship Him. That's exactly what He's saying. So the call of God on your life, what might it be? Boy, there might be someone here that, that, that God is calling you to salvation. You've heard the gospel message, the good news, over and over and over and over again. But you've always had an excuse. You've always resisted God. The call of God is, come to me for salvation. Maybe there's someone else that, that uh, God has been calling you to serve in children or youth or on missions or whatever it is, and you've constantly said no, and you've been unwilling to make the adjustments in your life, and you're saying, now I'm going to do it, so you go. Some people, the call in your life, of God on your life, is He's calling you to leave some sins. As we looked at last week with Abram, to leave some people that draw you down and draw you back, that keep you stumbling, and God is saying, leave them and answer God's call. Might be someone else here that you feel that, boy, as, as God is speaking to you, that, that you feel like God is leading you to the next level in your spiritual journey and your spiritual service. Maybe you've been called to the ministry. That's God's call, and I want you to know something else. God's call, I want you to hear this well. God's call on the believer's life is never simply a private, quiet call. It is always public. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? Put it up on the screen. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others. I want you to know that your Christian walk and my Christian walk, my, your Christian faith and my Christian faith, it's not private and quiet. There's a thought going through, and I want you to understand this, our nation right now, that we have all the freedom in the world to worship right in here. Just don't take it out there. I want you to know that comes from a Bible word called hogwash. That our Christian faith is all about out there. This is not the essence of Christianity. It's what's about to happen the next six days of this week. That's Christianity. That's why Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father who is in heaven. So here's our Cottonwood Challenge. I gave you a challenge last week that hopefully you prayed through each and every day. Here's the challenge this week. You ready? Put it up there. Cottonwood Challenge. Our prayer challenge. There it is. Every day I want to ask you, I want you to ask God, what do you want to do through me to build your kingdom, God? What do you want to do through me to build your kingdom? Here's the next one. Acknowledge and confess your past excuses for not serving and obeying God. My guess is we can all look back on times in our lives when we've heard God clearly speak to us, do this, do this, and we've said no. Just confess them. Next, commit that this time will be different and make an adjustment in your life to follow God by faith. And here's how we're going to close. I want to invite Keith and the band out as we close. Today, our deacons, I invite the deacons to go ahead and take their places back at the Lord's Supper table. Anytime we come to the Lord's table, it should be a season and a time of commitment. That we come and say, God, whatever you've called me to do, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to follow you. It's also a time when we're reminded through the bread and through the juice of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. So maybe you can take and pray these prayers and say, just God, I want to confess my unwillingness to obey you that I've had in the past. I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. I'm going to make some decisions to make some changes in my life right now. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. Then they're going to begin to sing. Keith's going to begin to sing. And you're going to be dismissed at your own pace, at your own speed, to journey back to the Lord's Supper table to take the bread and take the juice and be reminded of God's sacrifice for you through His Son on the cross. 
And the invitation he is following, he is asking you to follow him. To answer God's call, whatever it might be. God's call on your life, salvation, to follow him, to serve in a ministry, to give. It's an act of stewardship, whatever it is. You say yes. Father, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for Moses. I love the, I love the testimony of this season of Moses because it's just real. It's just real. So many times we can look on TV right now and we can, we can see so many fake things, but this is real. A man called by God who had some questions about his own ability who's in many seasons, in many ways, just unwilling. But you chose to use him anyway. And the children of Israel were eventually rescued from the hands of the Egyptians. God, my prayer is for every man and woman here that you would re-institute your call on their life. You'd renew it. You'd refresh it. Call them to obedience and faithfulness. And then, Lord, I pray that we're a congregation filled with people that constantly say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Yes, Lord. Send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.